Saxon Algebra 2, Lesson 96. Yay, it's our last lesson before spring break. 96, we're almost to 100, you guys. It's always exciting. Uh, this is a two-parter, I'm sorry to say. And the first topic has lots of nice algebra, but it also has words, so I apologize. Um, we've talked about variations several times before. I'm going to recap what we already know, but this is just expanding our variations problems. We know that there are two kinds of variations. There are direct variations. That's when the number of toddlers in the room varies directly with the number of toys on the floor. And the inverse is when dads walk into a room full of pizzas laid out and the more dads that walk in, the fewer slices of pizza that are, are left behind. Draw me a nice chart. There are two different sets of formulas we can use to calculate these things. The first one is called the constant method. And the other one is called the proportion method. Uh, I see pros and cons to both, so I don't highly recommend one over the other. Um, the first one is, and we just use random letters for this. We match them to the story in real life. Um, using a constant, we say that the number of apples is directly related to the number of bananas. Or we can say it's inversely related. Right? Those are the two forms that the equation can take. If we're using the proportion method, then we say A1 over A2 equals B1 over B2. Right? And then the inverse version of this formula, you flip the Bs. What? That's crazy, right? Okay, so this is what we already know. This is what we've used. And we're gonna to continue to use this. Um, I'm just looking to see if John, John calls us this the ratio method. Same difference. I just wanna throw that out there so you don't get confused. Uh, John shows how to work these problems in both formats. I will not show both formats, but I will use um, the constant method for one and the ratio method for the other. I'll start with the constant method. What we're doing in these problems is we're combining things. Um, we're, we're dealing with more complicated situations. Let me just say that. Example 96.1. And there are two problems. Yes, and then we do our part B. Okay. The number of girls varied inversely as the number of boys and directly as the number of teachers. All right, let's use the constant method. So we'll work on this. But it's there's a, an inverse and a direct variation going on together. Okay, let me just read it again slowly. The number of girls varies inversely as the number of boys and directly as the number of teachers. So the boys are inverse, so I put them in the denominator. The teachers are direct, so I put them on top. We're comparing, comparing all of these things at the same time. Oh, okay. So we know there's gonna be a scenario one and we'll find out about the girls and the boys and the teachers and we'll use that to calculate K and then there will be a scenario two where we'll get two out of the three and solve for the last one. All right, let's look. And this is just like we do with so many problems. Look at the words enough just to figure out what's going on. Get your formula, set yourself up, then go back and deal with all the numbers. Don't look too closely at the numbers the first time through. They just will confuse you. The number of girls varied inversely as the number of boys and directly as the number of teachers. Okay, we already knew that. When there were 50 girls, there were 20 teachers and 10 boys. 
I could stop right now and solve for my constant, but I'm just gonna keep going. How many boys were there? Okay, so that's our mystery. When there were 10 girls and 100 teachers. Work the problem twice. First use the variation form and then use the ratio form. Well, if it says that in the homework, I guess you have to. Um, this is what John's calling the variation form. And this is what he's calling the ratio form. I don't like those names, but that's fine. Um, just so you know what he's talking about. All right, we're doing the constant form slash variation form. Here's our formula. So we take our scenario one, we plug all this in, and we solve for K. So we get 50 equals 20 times K. I'm just flipping the order of that because I don't like to have my variable first. 20K divided by 10. Oh, okay. I can reduce that really easily. I get, and I'm just gonna go up here and use this space a little bit. 50 equals 2K, right? K equals 25. Good to know. That's our formula, so I'm gonna puffy cloud that. All right. Solving is the same as always, straightforward. Now we have our constant, no we got, we go down here, we use our same formula, and we just plug in the pieces that we know this time. 10 equals, now I can put the K first, because it's a number, the number of teachers is 100, and the number of boys is what I don't know. All right, as soon as I see this, I could have done this last time, but those simplified so easily, I liked to leave it. But I can cross multiply, right? I could have cross multiplied there as well. Here I'm gonna cross multiply, and I'm gonna get 10B equals 2500, right? Divide by 10. And the number of boys equals 250. That's the right answer. Okay, so what was new and different with this was just figuring out how to smush both of those conditions into one combined variation, right? All right, now we'll do the second problem, and this time we'll use the proportion method just to show you that it's just as easy. It's Neither one of these is better or worse than the other. It's just a question of, I guess, what you're in the mood for. Okay, so let's read our story and find out what's going on. Strawberries varied jointly as plums and tomatoes. Okay, what that implies, and it's kind of hard, you kind of have to read between the lines on this, is that um, they're all direct variations. There's nothing inverse and they're all going together. So we can say that Strawberries one over strawberries two equals plums one over plums two times tomatoes ones over tomato two. Everybody's moving in the same direction, so we'll use one over two for everything. Okay, now we can make our list of the variables and I'm gonna do S1, P1, T1, because John usually gives us all the first information and then he usually switches to the other. So I'm gonna put it in that order rather than going S1, S2, P1, P2, T1, T2. T1, T2, that's fun to say. All right, and then I'm gonna set up a nice buckety business here. And what I recognize is I don't have to write these as separate fractions. I can smush them into one big thing. Okay, I'm ready now. Go back to look for numbers. If 500 strawberries went with four plums and 25 tomatoes. I know that they're all scenario one because John says they went with. That's his code for saying they're all the part of the same scenario. <clears throat> How many plums, there's my mystery, would go with 40 strawberries and two tomatoes? Okay. <clears throat> so now all I have to do, plug everything in and simplify. I'm going to do that and then I'm gonna come back and tell you something about 
a different way I could decide to do the problem right at this point. <clears throat> but I'm gonna go ahead with this. Okay, 500, 4, 25, right? I organized these so it would be easy to fill in. And then down here, 40, P2, and two. All right. I'm going to cancel as much as I can. 40 goes into 500, no, not evenly, but I can, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm reducing the fraction on this side first. 50 divided by four is the same as 25 over two. That's much better. This I can do as Cancel those two and I can do 50 over P2. Okay, so I'm just simplifying the numbers on each side of the equation. I haven't been swimming any fish yet. All right, I could have just cross multiplied with all those big numbers, but you know me, I like to make things small before I make them big. Now I'm gonna cross multiply. And I'm going to get 25 times P2 equals 50 times 2. Remember, I don't like to multiply here because I know I have one more thing, one more number to combine over here. And I like to wait because sometimes the numbers are easier to cancel if I can see the smaller pieces rather than multiply them up. And this is a great example of that. That reduces to 2. And so I get the number of plums would be 4. And that's the correct answer. I can write it in either or both places, but yay. All right, so we worked one problem using the constant method and one using the proportion method. In the book, John shows how to work both problems both ways. All right, so if for any reason you should want to see that, hop onto page it's page 399 through 400. Okay, now what I wanted to say when we were at this stage is that very often in the sciences, when we have complex calculations like this and we're using di more difficult numbers, our numbers were pretty easy, right? What we very often do is we s solve the equation in its variable form for the one we're trying to find and then we don't have to do as much algebra with all the messy numbers. So what I would have done, and we'll talk more about this when we get to those lessons. Maybe we're already doing it. We would, we're wanting to solve this for P2. So we would cross multiply S1 P2 T2 equals S2 P1 T1 and then we would divide away the pieces we don't want, right? We're trying to isolate that. Right, and then we divide, because then that cancels these, and then we would get we would get a customized formula that would allow us to solve directly for our desired variable. And what many mathematicians think, and I completely agree, is that it's a lot easier to do the algebra with letters than it is with the numbers if your numbers are difficult and full of decimals and scientific notation, which they often are. We were lucky enough to have these very cute numbers that canceled beautifully. But this is a strategy you can use when you're dealing with equations that have lots of pieces like this is rearrange the algebra first, then plug in the numbers, right? And you solve for the desired variable. We're solving the abstract equation for the desired variable before plugging in the values. And again, it's just easier to do algebra with a few simple letters than it is with a bunch of crazy numbers. 
Okay, part B. Oh look, there's a random calculation I did. I can tell I did it for Algebra 1 because it's an orange. Um, I guess I needed a little bit of workspace one lesson and we just grabbed this book. All right, part B, more on irrational roots. This harkens back to our systems of nonlinear equation problems. Uh, and we're just gonna make them a little bit harder and a little bit crazier. You'll see what I mean. Let me show you the problem and you'll be like, oh yeah, I remember these. Solve. X minus two Y equals three. Okay, that looks nice and normal. We don't have any problems with that. And then remember like this kind of business. Oh yeah, they're nonlinear. John's not telling us what kind they are, which I think is sad. But he's telling us that we need to solve this system of equations and he's giving us a spoiler up here. We're gonna have irrational roots which means we're gonna have some wacky numbers coming up. Okay, we can do that. They're not complex, so we're not gonna be dealing with I, but he's telling us these answers are gonna get a little wild. Okay, we know that the way that we do this is we have to reshape this and substitute it in. There's no way to use elimination in this because they look too different. So we'll do X equals six divided by Y, right? We would divide both sides mentally by Y. All right, and then we're gonna plug that in there. So we'll get six over y minus two y equals three, All right? That's plugged in there and I'm using that equation. Now we'll multiply everything by y to get rid of our disgusting denominator and we get six minus two y squared equals three y, yikes. Let's swim everything to the right. Zero equals positive two y squared plus three y. His sign doesn't change because he's already over there. And then this would become minus six. All right, this is now ready to be factored, right? The, the, usually I have the zero here. Let's just move this, we'll move the zero over here. We can do that, we're not changing anything. Um, we're just rewriting the problem. Now, we know we can't factor this by inspection because we've got a lead coefficient that we can't get rid of. There's no way we can divide everything by two. So, John's advice, and I agree, is just go straight to the man-eater. Don't, don't worry about, we, we've ruled out factoring by inspection because there's a lead coefficient and if we divide by two, then we end up with a fraction. No, that's not gonna work. This one would be a whole number, right? If we divided it by two, but this is drama. We can't fix it. So let's just go to the man eater. He's our friend. A is two, B is three, C is minus six. Get the beast recorded on your paper. In our new lessons, we haven't used him in a while, but this is a great example of how he comes up handy in lots of different applications. Here we are solving a system of nonlinear equations and we need him, we need that little man-eater. Okay, let's plug in using our buckets. Always worth the trouble. This is how I feel. I don't like to waste my energy on steps that aren't necessary, but I also don't like to get things wrong for silly little reasons and have to and make mistakes and have to do it over. I don't like to have to do problems over. So I would rather take a little precaution and know that I'm much more likely to get the right answer the first time if I just use the flipping buckets. So I don't use them just to be a baby. I use them because they actually make a difference in how much work I have to do. I plug in the Bs. I like to do it that way. I like to go B, A, and A, and then C. Some people like to fill in the As, then the Bs, then the Cs. I find myself liking to do it that way. It doesn't matter. All right, I simplify here before I go on. 
I get 9 plus 40, let's see, 2 times 4 is 8. 8 times 6 is 48. So this becomes 57. Positive 57. Yeah, because this is positive and then I added to it. All right, so I get x equals minus 3 plus or minus the square root of 57 over 4. Oh, Lord have mercy, right? Now we have to find... Oh, I see what I, one thing I did that I don't like. Normally we set the quadratic up as x equals, but in this particular problem, I had, I had substituted out the x and I was working this in y. So this is actually my y value. And again, I know that because here, where I substituted my equations. There's no x in sight, is there? Everything's a y. So this is actually my value for y. Now, we're going to use this value to solve for x. And what I like to do is I'm gonna rearrange this so that x is by itself. x equals two y plus three. So now what I'm gonna to have to do is plug this monster into that and solve. All right, let me take the pieces over here. Never mind, not that big. X equals two y plus three. That's my rearranged first equation. And then what I got for y, here, I'll write it in two separate pieces. Y equals minus three over four plus square root of 57 over four. And then over here, y equals minus three over four minus. All right, I'm breaking them out into separate fractions because I think that's gonna help with my calculation. Okay, so now what I have to do is plug each of these into this. So I'm gonna say x equals two times this monster oh. How do we live, you guys? Oh, this is 57. Okay, the difference between the two is just the plus or minus right there, All right? Okay, so now we have to simplify this and I see that it's primarily gonna be that reduces to two, to two, right? Two and four cancels to two. This reduces also to two. But in order to add this three, I'm gonna have to make that six over two, right? Now I can combine positive six over two with negative three over two, and I'll get x equals positive three over two plus square root of 57 over two. So my first point of intersection is three over two plus square root of 57 over two, minus three over four plus Can you imagine? That's the answer. That is the first point at which these two shapes, whatever they are, we're pretty sure one's a line, but the other one, who knows? That's the first point where these two intercept intersect. Oh my gosh, that was painful, wasn't it? It's just a disgustingly horrifying answer, 
but it is correct. And that's one thing I will tell you about these problems is when you're checking your answer, it's almost as much work as doing the problem. You have to be so careful to get all the plus signs and all the little details right. All right, have you recovered enough from this to try the second one? At least we know how it's gonna flow. Okay, we've got it plugged in. Now this two cancels against the two denominators. We know that. We know we need to give this a denominator of two because we have to add this to this. So we get x equals minus three and plus six gives us plus three over two minus square root of 57 over two. And so our second pair of points is this is the x and this is the y. Again, super, super close. These two are exactly the same except one's plus and one's minus. These two are exactly the same, but one's plus and one's minus. Which makes a certain amount of sense as we've seen, like it could be a, a graphing situation like this, right, where one's a circle, something like that, or it could be a parabola maybe. It's a line going through something and chopping it at two weird places. And this tells us that it's very balanced and symmetrical. But we don't need to draw the picture. We don't have to worry about it. But this is sort of pleasing to us that we see these points are so regimented and even. All right, that's our answer. It's right. I mean, hold on to your hat. Are we likely to have a problem like this on the test? Yes, 100%. Are we likely to have one of those wacky variation type problems on the test? Yes, 100%. So holler if you need help on these, but you got it. I have great faith in you. Okay, I'll talk to you soon. Goodbye.